I'm Kimberly Brandt with Preservation Maryland. So for this session, we are going to take a deep dive into two high profile redevelopment projects involving historic buildings. So we're pleased to have two experienced developers with us today to walk us through those projects. So we have Michael Joy of Joy Development and Evan Morville of Seawall Development Company. So what we're going to do is we'll have them present and then we'll do question and answer um, after you've heard from both of them. And we are recording this session, so whatever questions you have, I will repeat um, so they're picked up um, on the audio recording. So we're gonna start with Evan of Seawall. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak with you this afternoon about seawall development, about specifically the project that we completed in 2012, uh, Union Mill. Um, I'll let you read that if you want. I'll give you the, the narrated version. Seawall Development Company was formed in 2007 as a company, as a real estate development company that wanted to really reimagine real estate development. We didn't want to do it like our fathers, so to speak, and we were really interested in the social aspect of development and what could real estate development bring to, the social, to a social cause. So for us, real estate development was this opportunity to create meaningful change through real estate development. When we looked at Baltimore, we recognized that there were about, you know, there are three major issues in our mind, real estate taxes, crime, and education. And how could we effect, effectuate change through real estate in any or all of those three areas? It's interesting when you think about those three areas in Baltimore, they're really interlinked through one, which is education. Education is a real big problem in the city of Baltimore, retaining families, retaining teachers. And the thing that we recognized was that with good education, families will stay. With more people staying in the city of Baltimore, there'll be uh, more revenue coming in. The real estate taxes will be able to be lowered. And with folks moving in, obviously crime will go down. And the first project we completed in 2009 was Miller's Court. And we developed it under the notion of creating affordable housing for teachers and nonprofit office space. What we had seen uh, through some relationships that we had through Teach for America was that the city was hiring between 700 and 1,000 new teachers a year. If you choose the wrong neighborhood to live in in Baltimore and then you go work in a Baltimore City school system, school, you probably will last a month, uh, maybe two at the most. And so what, what Teach for America really came to us with was this opportunity to create affordable housing for those new teachers coming to Baltimore. In essence, rolling out the red carpet for the teachers so that they could be surrounded by other like-minded individuals uh, and celebrate the good days and commiserate the bad days. So true to our form of trying to create this socially conscious real estate development company, we opened up the development process to Miller's Court uh, to the community and to uh, six teachers that we had, had uh, become friends with and that we asked to be a part of the development process with us. What those six teachers said was, we need a place that we can feel safe in living. We need a place that supports the work that we're doing and provides the resources that we can't otherwise get in other facilities. So we said, well, what's the rent? What rent do you want to pay? $800 a month. We'll figure out a capital stack. We'll figure out a sources and uses that allows us to do that. We need a copy machines and cop copy centers because most of the school systems, if they have copiers, they don't have paper. Teachers are going out in the evening, late at night, making copies for lessons for their students. We'd love to have a fitness center that we don't have to pay for. We'd love to have parking that we don't have to pay for. We'd love to have a place that the property management company respects who we are and what we're doing and listens to the things that we need and is responsive to our, our needs. And so in, in creating Seawall Development Company, the notion was to try to really embrace and hug all of those concepts and, and achieve all of them in a way that those teachers could be supported and last longer than the two months that a lot of them are uh, lasting. And so we've completed Miller's Court in 2009 uh, it was 40 apartments, new to t new, uh, 40 apartments for teachers new to Baltimore. And the other component to the development company was creating nonprofit office space. 
we saw that there was about 24 different nonprofits in the city of Baltimore um, in the education field, all within, all, all in different locations, very little collaboration, no real uh, economies of scale or sharing of resources, and not writing grants together. So when we set out to do a project, we wanted to incorporate a non a nonprofit office component to it. We worked with a number of the nonprofits again to figure out what rent they needed. We created basically build to suit spaces for them that we would design for them. Uh, we created spaces that allowed more light to come in by really focusing on uh, pushing the office space towards the interior of the building and allowing the exterior walls to be free of, of private offices. Um, we created conference rooms. We created kitchen space that they otherwise would have to pay rent on. One of the notions that we had for the nonprofits was that they were wasting money every year paying for space that they weren't using on a daily basis, on a constant basis. And so we created these conference rooms that they don't pay rent on. We create kitchen areas that they don't pay rent on. They have outdoor space that they don't pay rent on. And so the combination of teacher housing and nonprofit office space as a result of a need that we saw really was kind of the, the, the founding notion, the founding principle of seawall development. Um, since 2007, 2009, when we finished our first project, we've done about $400 million worth of real estate development in Remington, which is the small little community southwest of Johns Hopkins, just south of, of Hamden, and uh, a really a, a hidden treasure that, that so many people had kind of driven through to get to Hopkins or Charles Village for 25, 35 years. When we finished Miller's Court, we recognized the the beauty of the process that we had just gone through with the community, the trust that had just been built. And, and so they, they really wanted us to focus uh, on more development in Remington. And so I think a lot of the work that we've done that you know about has been in Remington. The second project that we completed as a result of the success of Miller's Court was Union Mill. Uh, Union Mill was a direct result and, and, and a, a, a total um, extension of, of our philosophy and concept at Miller's Court. Union Mill is the largest stone mill in the state of Maryland. It was built in 1866, later redeveloped in 1872, or added on to in 1872. It's the only mill built along the Jones Falls that did not use water for power. The smokestack here is, when we developed it, was only about that high. But this boiler house building was a really a, a unique building for Union Mill and the mills along the Jones Falls because they would burn coal to generate steam and power to, to uh, operate the machinery. It was built as a cotton duck mill. The Jones Falls produced 70% of the world's cotton duck in the late 1800s. That's a really amazing statistic. Uh, the Jones Falls was a, a real uh, uh, river of commerce uh, in the late 1800s. The building was built by Horatio Gambrel, as in Gambrel's Maryland and Anne Arundel County. He spun off from the Mount Vernon mill, which uh, was recently redeveloped, and built his own mill, and it's a phenomenal building. It is one of the most amazing buildings and the hardest project that I will ever do in my life, which I am so excited about because it's over, and I, don't have, to, I, have, I, have, I have only good, easy projects to look forward to. I wish. Uh, Union Mills, 56 apartments for teachers new to Baltimore, 27 one-bedrooms, 29 two-bedrooms, the 30,000 square feet of office space for, for nonprofits, some of the amenities that I, that I mentioned um, in my opening comments, and then Artifact uh, Cafe, 1,500 square foot cafe uh, through an extension of Woodbury Kitchen. has been a really amazing addition to not only Union Mill, but uh, the Woodbury and Hamden communities. What made Union Mill so amazing was that it was this stone structure that had really been occupied for its entire life except for two years. From 2000, uh, 2005 and six, no, excuse me, 2007 and eight, it was vacant as a result of some, uh, an acquisition that, uh, of the company that sold it or the company that, that operated it. And so it had only been vacant for two years when we really took it over in 2009. Um, and these are just some old pictures from the 60s, 70s, just showing you 
this, this phenomenal building. Here are some of the pictures from 2009 when we started really looking into the building and, and, and becoming very um, uh, interested in, in its redevelopment. We began the project in 2010. This is a courtyard. Some of the key features of Union Mill is the walls at the bottom are 36 inch solid stone. Tapers up to 18 inches at the top. Um, the first floor and second floor and third floor of the residential component, which was the original portion built in 1866, 65 foot long columnless spans, which for a real estate developer, 65 foot width building is absolutely perfect for residential development. No columns, amazing. This building is going to be incredible. The cool thing about the building, and you'll see in some of the after pictures, is that it was a big U. They built the portion along Union Avenue in 1866, and they built an L that created a U in 1872. And so there was this half acre courtyard in the middle of the space, which really created this unique opportunity that a lot of buildings don't uh, have the, uh, the chance to um, excuse me, use. Just showing you some of the before pictures of there was only two original will, uh, uh, windows in the entire building which was fun working with uh, MHT and the National Park Service to get them to um, understand and, and agree with us on what details mattered and what details didn't. But we worked well with them and we came up with a solution that I think everybody was ultimately really happy with. But one of the biggest challenges in this project is that it was a 150 year old uh, stone mill with stone and wood headers and nothing was level, nothing was plumb, nothing was straight, nothing was even remotely standard. Every single dimension had to be measured. Every single component and, and piece that fit into the building had to be uh, customized. This is the commercial portion that was added in 1872. You'll see that they had some uh, brick detail here at the top, which was, which, which was pretty cool. But the general condition of the building was, was like a, a one out of a scale of ten. Uh, ten. The next few sh slides show some of the interior spaces. So the original portion in 1866 was completely columnless. The portion built in 1872 had these cast iron, cast iron uh, fluted columns, which were absolutely beautiful. And we tried to restore those and, and highlight them in the apartments and office space as much as possible, really just the office space. But you'll see here on the bottom left-hand side, there's no columns in this space. This is columns here, columns here, columns there, obviously. It, built in 1860, 1866 is a cotton duck factory. They had 54 inch wainscoting. They had plaster walls. This was, a, this was a, a structure that was built as if though it was not gonna be a warehouse or a factory, but something that was gonna be livable. And so we highlighted all that. We restored all of the old 54 inch wainscoting, put in new window sills, window framing, highlighted the, the columns. There was a, a, a bunch of old machinery that we actually were able to clean up and restore and leave in place. Um, this is a, these are some pictures of the old boiler house. This right here being the bottom of the chimney. Right here being the bottom of the chimney. This, build, this room right here actually being uh, an old boiler room in the boiler room, which was interesting. Uh, and, but this was the, this building was the building in the worst condition. Uh, and as you would have it, as we started construction about six months in, we discovered that there were six foot tunnels underneath the building where they would literally from the outside of the building wheel in coal or not wheel it in, but wheel out the ash from the boiler being burned to create, uh, their steam and electricity. So 18 months, $20 million later, $21 million later, um, Union Mill started to, to transform itself and, and turn back into what it originally was. Um, here you can see the courtyard being redeveloped. We had to basically pull out the first top two feet of the soil because it was environmentally contaminated. So we pulled off the top two feet of the soil, regraded the site to create four tiers. The 
because of the way the building is, is built into the hill uh, of the property, we couldn't merely level off the courtyard because we would lose usable space on the first floor or we would undermine the foundation on the second floor uh, closest towards us. My biggest fear going into this project was the masonry. It was horrible. And we spent months meeting with mason after mason after mason to try and figure out the proper scope for an 86,000 square foot, 150 year old stone mill. In my mind and in my heart, I just wanted to do the whole thing. I wanted to do it right. This was a project that we were gonna keep for 30 years. This isn't something that we were gonna redevelop and flip, and so let's do it quick and cheap. Let's do it right. Let's do it the way that uh, it should be done. Let's take pride in, in the work. And so there were 15 masons. Took them 11 months every single day. $778,000 for repointing, and it was the easiest, best part of the project. <laughs> so from this point forward, I've always identified the worst component to a project, and never of them have ever been the worst. So, so while it was the hardest project, I think it set me up for this, this belief, if I come up with the hardest part of the project, that actually won't be the hardest part of the project. Uh, you'll just, just again, I'm going to start showing you some during pictures of the uh, redevelopment. Um, you know, every component, all the plaster had to be restored. All the, we could not, the floors were so out of level and so out of whack that we ended up having to put plywood down and putting gypcrete to create this nice level space uh, for the flooring to adhere to. This is the boiler house building as we start to clean it out. Um, and this is my favorite part of the building. This has the most character, and this is really where we uh, highlighted as much of the structure as we possibly could and had the benefit of that through the office use. The office use really allowed us to keep the space open versus a residential use, having to cut it up and put a bunch of demising walls and hard ceilings. So the decision to keep this a commercial uh, space and a, and a cafe space really allowed us the opportunity to um, uh, keep that, that open. The, the picture here, this is the opening to the cupola, uh, or the bell tower, not really a cupola, but the bell tower. And you'll see that in some of the after pictures. Um, this, this, is, this was basically a toxic wasteland. There, were, there was over three feet of pigeon dung in the boiler or in the uh, bell tower ceiling of the bell tower. It was in the within between the roof and the where the bell would have been. The bell had been sold and salvaged by a previous owner. And so we spent quite a bit of time and energy cleaning out this this space uh, so that it could actually become inhabitable. And there's a bedroom in there now, uh, which is really cool because it's probably the coolest bedroom in all of Union Mill by far. This, this was probably the biggest headache. And this was a 45 foot span of the building that collapsed during construction. Uh, site contractor got a little overzealous with his, his uh, excavation and undermined, undermined the foundation of the building and it completely collapsed uh, uh, in this, as you can see. The most amazing thing is we were, we were able to put these three, four, four shorings in uh, within about 15 minutes those were in, which meant this span of roof and these three trusses were completely unsupported for 15 minutes. And they didn't move at all. It was unbelievable. I could not believe it. When I got the call that this happened and I came, I was like beside myself and I couldn't believe the whole roof didn't collapse. So while it was a horrible experience, it could have been a hell of a lot worse. Um, and today you, you, you couldn't even tell that it was, that it was uh, collapsed after they rebuilt it. So here are a, a bunch of after pictures. Um, you can see the beautiful repointing job. It was 100% repoint of the entire building. Any 
portion of the interior space that was going to be exposed was repointed. And I think that and obviously the windows were the two things that just completely transformed the structure. You'll see what we were able to do with the, the courtyard. We created these four livable areas or usable areas. Kind of the, the, the top area has become a little bit of a de facto uh, patio space for the office tenant that occupies this entire portion of the building. The third level here um, in hopefully 10 years will become more of an, like an urban forest. It's a very small one. Uh, and then a really an activities area. And this courtyard, this piece of grass is sized exactly to a standard rental tent so that someone could come, put a tent up, and it would be absolutely perfect for them. They'd have that entire space covered. And then the lower portion um, right here is an outdoor patio area for all of the residential and commercial tenants along with the, the patrons at Artifact Coffee. One of the other key challenges for this structure was figuring out how we were going to provide HVAC. It's a pitched roof. MHT and the National Park Service was never going to let us put condensers on the roof. And I was adamant that we could not have 160 split systems all over the property. It would just look ridiculous. And so we worked uh, hand in hand. And Union Mill has been a featured project of the Mitsubishi Variable Refrigerant Flow the mini split system uh, technology. So in 2009, we signed with Mitsubishi to help us think through the HVAC of the building. And you'll see here, these structures right here, we were able to use. And one of these, so two fans, is eight apartments. And that was a huge savings for us. And we only have two banks of, uh, excuse me, three banks of HVAC outdoor condensers. This right here, this one right here, and there's one just on the other side of the building right there. And so we don't have these split systems everywhere. We were really able to preserve a three and a half acre piece of property in the heart of the city of Baltimore. And it's become this really cool uh, urban oasis that we have weddings in, we have parties in, we have functions in, and, and um, the residents use it quite often and, and enjoy it thoroughly. Uh, it's it's the, the property in and of itself, I think, is what also makes Union Mill special. Just some more after pictures of the courtyard. There's the bell tower we, we, I spoke of. Um, there's a bedroom in this portion. Uh, and then this is just a stairwell coming out to the street. Just the, the front side along Buena Vista, which was, what was interesting is that they took, let's see if we got this on. What was interesting is they took and connected the 1866 building with a brick structure to another stone structure um, and to create that U. So the piece that connects the two stone structures is this unique um, uh, brick structure that has these almost floor to ceiling windows. And so the office space in there is pretty amazing. This will uh, give you a little example of uh, some of the office space and some of the common area space, really being able to highlight the texture. I've always been a proponent that the most wonderful thing about uh, historic redevelopment is less is more. Everybody tries to create, create all these amazing spaces. Just let the building speak for itself. Let the texture of the building speak for itself. Let's highlight that texture. Let's highlight that history. Let's create as much exposed space as possible. One of the things that we've done extensively on 90% on, on of our projects is leave the, the ceiling structure exposed, putting the insulation, the R30 insulation on top so that you don't have to put it on the bottom and you can leave that exposed and you're still getting the same quality insulation that uh, you would if you, if, you didn't, if you didn't have that. Um, it was a challenging project, as I stated. It was a $20 million project. We had new market tax credits. We had federal historic tax credits. We had state historic tax credits. We had a very uh, uh, small inclusionary housing loan from the city of Baltimore. And we had an $8 million loan. One of the really founding principles of the company is when we do our financial models for our projects, Tebow and I are constantly pushing 
to charge the lowest possible rent that we possibly can. Um, it's just a belief that we have that w we'd rather have a 100% occupied building that has the ability to go up than a building that's 80% leased and only has the ability, ability to go down from a rent perspective. It also was the key component to allowing the teachers this opportunity to live in what we believe to be a class A building for class C and D prices. You could be a teacher new to Baltimore, live in the Union Mill in a one bedroom apartment for $830. No, there's no cost for the parking, there's no cost for the SIP Fitness Center. The copy machines are at cost. You're not paying 11 cents like you would at, at Kinko's, you're paying three cents. It's a, it's a fun place to be on a Friday and Saturday night because there are certain portions of the building where everybody's like stressed out and freaking out and there are other portions of the building where everybody's really excited because of the work that they're doing and they're really feeding off of each other. Um, this project allowed us to really branch out and do not only additional historic redevelopment uh, in Philadelphia, in Baltimore and Remington, but created a momentum that allowed us to do, start doing new construction with the same historic mentality, the same historic vision. And if anyone is familiar with Remington Row in uh, Remington, a lot of people will look at that building and they'll look at the reclaimed wood on the inside and they'll say, this is amazing. You guys got all this from the building. And I sometimes tell them it's a new building and sometimes I tell them it's not a new building uh, because it looks like it's 150 years old. So we have a real passion for these projects. We are honored to have had the opportunity to redevelop Union Mill and uh, look forward to doing future projects, not only in Baltimore, but other parts of the state of Maryland. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Michael Joy, um, and I'm the developer of the Foot or Die Works in Cumberland. Inter picking up on what Evan finished with, it's interesting because this is almost the exact opposite situation. This is, Cumberland is a place that used to be a very, very vibrant city, big economic center, all of that, and they're seeing, they've been seeing outflow of people, and they want to keep people, and they want to encourage new people to come. So they, wanted, they want high-end housing because they want to encourage people. Uh, IBM has a big facility just over the river in West Virginia. Orbital Science, uh, now it's Grumman Corporation, has a big facility. They want, but, and the biggest deterrent in hiring professional people is housing. So I've been developing historic renovation work in, in that area for the last 15 years, I guess. And um, this is an example of, and also retain professional people in the area, rather, and the young people who have educations from moving out and moving to other parts of the state and moving, leaving the area. So it's interesting in that regard. And also, and interesting in the financing, uh, we, um, got, we got a grant from the state um, initially um, when the RFP came out uh, we were, and I was asked to, to pr make a proposal, and uh, when our proposal was accepted, and then we went to the state, and we, had, we needed a grant because the state had owned the property for about 10 years and not done anything, any remediation or done anything, just left it vacant, let it sit sallow. Um, we um, said, well, we need um, a million and a half dollars just to start from the state. And it was proposed to the state and went to the Board of Public Works meeting, and Governor Hogan, and there was like 100 people on the Board of Public Works, he said, who's here from the footer building? And we stood up and he said, come on up here. And he said, uh, you, well, your grant's approved. And he said, thank you very much. And he said, Mike, thanks a lot. Now, he did, I didn't think he remembered, but I met him many, many years ago when he was a young real estate um, broker in Prince George's County. And I was a young real estate broker in Prince George's County where we both grew up. And I said, you don't remember the government holder? And he said, yeah, I do. And so he said, thank you very much. And I realized then that we'd overpaid. And he was right. <laughs> so this is the, this is the building. This photo was taken two years ago on July 4th when the building was still under construction. What you're seeing on the left is, is the old original, uh, we, we redid the, um, the original paint that was on the side of it. The footer's dye works was, what did I do wrong here? Oh, there we go. Okay. The footer dye works was originally 400,000 square feet of space. The place that you see on the left right there, that is what is le was left when we got the building of the 400,000 square feet. It was the largest dye works in the country at that time. Uh, a dye works is a place that precur was a precursor to dry cleaners. They cleaned fine fabrics and linens and stuff. The Queen of England sent her stuff over here. And it was a very, very successful business um, until the advent of dry cleaning. 
in which case that basically put them out of business in the 1930s. It was originally built in about 19, starting from 1907 to 1912, employed hundreds and hundreds of people. This is what the building was when we got it. Since that time, a highway came through. That's Interstate 68, which is immediately to the north of the building. And this is all that was left at the building. Immediately to the south or the left is the Canal Place Preservation and Historic Area, which is 12 acres. There's a railroad there. There's a, an old historic railroad building. There's a lot of stuff. There's a fairgrounds. The um, CNO Canal, oops, if any of you uh, are bikers, the CNO Canal ends right there, the path to the CNO Canal. You can ride 182.4 miles to Washington, D.C., Georgetown on that canal, right? Or you can start right here and take the Great Allegheny Passage to Pittsburgh, 150 miles. So you can go to Pittsburgh to D.C. without ever getting off the, off the trail. Um, this is what the building looked like on the west facade when we got it. Um, those, so we had the ghost lettering, and we also had historic photos, so we knew exactly what the lettering would look like. The building is pretty narrow. It's uh, 45 feet wide, and it's 238 feet long. So uh, at one point, there had also been, uh, well, you also can see the windows, which we'll talk about a little bit. That's the north facade again, which is the side that faces the highway. This was what was we got on the left. You can see here that there had been something there. Well, there was a sawtooth structure that went out to about here and back, which is part of the original building. It was demolished when a prior developer had, um, had the building under his control. And his plan really was to tear the building down and put a Denny's right there. Um, and um, I don't know if any of you know Doug Reed from uh, um, Central Maryland. He's a great, he was the big advocate. He was on the Canal Place Preservation Development Authority. He got the house, on a the building on a national register so it could not be torn down. And so uh, then they did the RFP. And so we were the successful ones. So we went forward. First thing we did was put scaffolding over the whole thing. As you can see, those things up at the top were um, just hold, they were put up there. I was put up there years ago to keep the, the, sli the stone, I mean, the uh, ceramic the clay tiles, excuse me, from the roof from falling off and landing on people. The predominant architectural features are the windows. There's 138, 130 double windows and about 18 single windows in the building. And the other um, architectural most significant thing is the roof. It's a French clay tile roof, which is very, very cool. Um, that gray structure you see right there was an elevator tower that was built at a later date. Uh, we did not use that for our elevator tower. We'll use, we use that as the entrance to our apartments, which, which I'll show you as we go along. So we basically scaffolded the whole thing first. And then we started working on the roof. There's the front, that's the view westward of the, C, of the Potomac River, the CNO Canal, and those hills are in West Virginia. So it's right on the river. Uh, that's a fairgrounds as part of Canal Place there. You'll see another picture later. The, the area was failing largely because those snow guards had failed over the years and allowing snow to get under and permeate. And then over the years, it kind of deteriorated the structure. This is, anybody familiar with French clay tiles? They're very cool because the water comes down here and it gets split right there and it goes between these two tiles and gets split right there and the next two tiles and all the way down. It's very cool. It's a great way to slow down the water. Um, each one of those tiles has one nail on it. And we were able to salvage about a third of them. Uh, another third we had to buy and another third uh, used from Cleveland, a building that was being torn down. And another third were new that we'd found at Uduichi uh, had a but some left. This is what it looked like when we started, you know, remediating the, the roof system. But it was pretty easy to do. We just took that out uh, and it was maintained. It has a bearing beam down the middle of the building. And um, it was just a lot of work and a, and a lot of high work. Um, when we started digging for our elevator shaft and on the interior of the building, we had an interesting discovery. We discovered hundreds and hundreds of these oyster shells. How in the world did oyster shells get up to underneath the building in Cumberland? Well, an archaeologist came and she told us, simple. And the people came up on the barges, the, you know, the canal boats from Georgetown. They would load up with oysters, bring them up, eat them along the way, throw them in the canal, throw the shells in the canal. When they got up to Cumberland, they'd either give them away or whatever was left, they'd dump them in the canal. And then when they dredged periodically, they dredged up the canal and they put it into naturally to go underneath buildings and stuff. <laughs> So we ended up with lots of, you don't even see oyster shells this big anymore. <laughs>
this is the work in process. We were able to get approval from the National Park Service in Maryland to put back a portion of the sawtooth structure for two reasons. One, the building being 238 feet long and 45 feet wide looked a little unstable. By having that sawtooth structure, they were able to kind of restabilize the appearance of the building. In addition, this area that's plywooded up, that, it was all originally open to the sawtooth section. So by building that section back up, we were able to go all the way through, so you have a all the way through view of the building. So, uh, and so there's the steel going in for that. It was not meant to be an historic renovation. We had to be careful not to make it look too historic. And you'll see in the photos later, there's a storefront on this side. But we were able to use the old bricks. The original bricks were saved. Um, well, they were, they were just not hauled away is what it was from when they tore down that section of sawtooth. So we were able to use those again. This is what it looks like. This is looking from the south side. Once we had all the windows out and once we had the, um, the roof on the sawtooth portion. This is the side everybody sees when they pull in the parking area. This is the opposite of the highway. Um, the windows, uh, we had uh, three different types of windows in the building. We had wood windows, wood double hung windows on, on the south side, um, which were sometimes replacement windows back in the 1930s or 40s. We don't know exactly when. We had old original wood windows on the east side and we had metal windows on the west side and metal windows on the north side. So we were able to restore the windows on the west side and the windows on the north side. So they are completely original windows, uh, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but um, that, and then we got new windows for the south and the north side, which I'll show you a little bit more. This is the interior. On the second, third, and fourth floor, we have apartments. We have eight apartments on each floor. There's eight different floors, plans, they stack on top of each other. Even though the building was big and open, it never had partitions in it. It was always built as an open space because, and they needed a lot of light, which is why they had all the windows, because people were, were doing fine work on linens, they needed light, natural light. So this is our partitions going up. These are pictures of our floors. The entire second, third, and fourth floor had heart pine floors, all of which were able to retain. So we have heart pine, beautiful heart pine throughout the entire building. Uh, and that's some that's in the process of being retained. This is um, beadboard, which is on the ceiling of the fourth floor. The white one is new, the dark, the gray one is old. We were able to find almost exact replicas of the beadboard. So the entire fourth floor, it has beadboard ceilings, because that's what was there originally. This is the uh, roof after we've restored it. This is the north side that had those, those skylights were original. Those skylights are, were, are replacements of the original, but they're exact replicas, $12,000 each for those skylights. Uh, we mixed the new and the old tiles. You can see new tiles here. You can see older tiles there. We mix them randomly. And so it's, it gives a random look and they're aging over time. So uh, it's really, really a beautiful roof system. And then at the top, we have the, uh, the cap tiles. It was hard to get them and hard to find people to put them down, but once they start going, it went very easily. Uh, this is the, a view to the west from uh, one, of the historic, one of the restored windows at the, at the top floor. That, that window is about six feet in diameter. That's the view west from the top floor of the building. So that, that shows you um, the river there the bridge going across the turning basin for the canal where the canal ends. This is a fairgrounds for the canal place. On the left there is a restored boat, a barge boat for the canal. And over there is IBM and Northrop Grumman. This is the north side. These windows on the first, second, and fourth floors are, are new exact replicas of the original windows. The third floor is all restored windows. We were able to get enough parts and pieces together to restore the entire third floor metal windows. We, um, the me windows, we found the manufacturer, uh, his name was on there, and we found a company in Louisiana who could make exact replicas of them. The hallways, one of the, and this is, if you look out the window, you're facing the highway. However, for some reason, they were always uh, obscured glass on the north side. 
We don't know exactly why. We don't know what they were looking at back in 1907 when the building was built, but they had obscured glass. So we put all new ob obscured glass in, and except the ones we restored, so you can't see the highway. And the hallways go down the length of the building, all the way down the hallways on the highway side. And one of the reasons for that was the state, particularly uh, Michael Day, if any of you me, said, this building was always open. We don't want people to see it all chopped up. We want to show them what it looked like. So we agreed to put a long hallway on the north side. So when you come out of the elevator, you see this long 238 foot hallway and the doors go in. That also buffers the people from the highway. So there's no highway noise in the apartments. And this is Interstate 68, this is a highway. As we say when we give people directions, if you're coming from the east, you get off at exit 43 and if you don't stop at the bottom of the ramp, you'll run into the building, which people have tried. Um, <laughs> um, so consequently, there's no, there's no highway sound. And also we learned that if you have an obscured light and you can't see the highway, it's not as noisy anyway. Um, you know, if you can't see something, you don't hear it as much. This is a um, sample of a restored window on the south, I mean, new window, exact replica on the south side. Those windows, we found Kolb and Kolb who could make exact replicas. The muttons are interesting. The vertical muttons are a different size than the horizontal muttons, which is very unusual. You hardly ever see that um, in a wood window. So we were able to get exact replicas of that and we kept a very simple industrial look on the trim. All the exterior walls have exposed brick, original brick. Some of it was painted and had been painted over the years um, and some was not and uh, the ones that weren't painted we left like that. We just put a clear sealer on them. But it's, it gives you that industrial look again. And that's, those are the uh, hardwood, I mean the hard pine floors. There was a sign we found, that sign is about eight feet long and about two and a half feet tall that we found that they had lit up at one point with Christmas bulbs and it was electrified. We thought about doing that again and we realized what an exorbitant involved thing that would be. So we just kind of cleaned it up and we put uh, plastic golf balls in it. So those are, <laughs> those are 75 cent plastic golf balls in this. <laughs> There's the finished building from the south um, showing there was a sign showing the sawtooth. You can see the storefront along here. Metal roof, this, and the sawtooth allows light in. Uh, what we, the other thing we wanted to do is we wanted to do something really cool here with the elevator tower and put, make it paint it a cool color, do all kinds of stuff, put window boxes. The state said, no, we don't want people looking at the old elevator tower. We want them looking at the brick, we want them looking at the windows. So we made it, a, we painted it gray, just put one window on each side that, um, people in there can look out and it's part of their apartments. They can look out towards the, the river. So those are very popular apartments. You've got a little special room that you can see the river. That's a little bit close up of the sawtooth structure. That's the exact same type of roof that was there originally. And as you can see, these windows here are shorter than these windows. That was because the sawtooth was there and they still wanted to get light. So those windows were about this far off the floor. So in those apartments on the fourth floor, we raised the floor uh, four feet. So you come and you go up the steps. So those are not original floors. We, we, got cop we got old floors when old gymnasium and put in there. So that way you can see out the window. Otherwise the windows would be this side. Of course, when you look out the window, you look at the back of the sawtooth. But you know, it is what it is. There's the storefront on the sawtooth. There's the windows from the inside of the sawtooth. And that's the, we, we did all wood up there. We weren't required to do anything because it wasn't supposed to be a replica. They don't want replicas, of course, but it gives you the feel of how it felt before. There's the hallway. So the north side and the highway side would be to your right and the apartment doors are on the left. There's one skylight in one of the apartments. There were six skylights. We've got one in the stair tower, which is pretty cool. So when you go up the stairs, you can see a skylight. Two apartments have lofts on the end and they have skylights in them. This is one where it just shines down in the kitchen. The kitchen cabinets are cabinets manufacturer I've used for, well, a long time. I don't want to say how long I've used them. <laughs> 30 years. Uh, they're from Hagerstown, Hagerstown Kitchens. If you ever use they've got make great cabinets. I've got them in my house. I just built a two and a half million dollar house in Northwest DC. It's got Hagerstown Kitchens, same cabinets. They're great cabinets. 
And we used granite countertops, and we kept everything kind of grayish, all, again, with the industrial kind of look. There's um, an, uh, another apartment. That, the, one on the, the ones on the end have lofts, and so we have a circular stair going up to a loft. That window you saw was in the loft. Um, here we have um, columns. There were columns to the build, out the building, these uh, U, very, very interesting double U columns, uh, which we had to leave open, so we just worked the kitchens around them, or the bathrooms. They always fell into the kitchens or the baths, it seemed. And we just worked it around. It was no big deal. Just cut it back. and So there's the building again. The, when, when this window was restored and put back in place, I said, I got there and I said, oh my God, the, wind, the muttons should be up and down. You know, all the rest of the windows are up and down. And the guy said, that's the way it is in the picture. And he's right. That's the way it is in the original picture. So that's why, they, so that's was done just exactly the same. So that's the story. Well, thank you all. How about we give our presenters a hand? And... All right.